only thing that matters is the ending. It's the most important part of the story. And this one is very good. This one is perfect. I'd been working with Columbia on a couple of movies, and, uh, and the executive there had bought the novella and sent it over and said, you should write and direct this. And I said, yes, you're right, I should. I guess I, I just really am drawn to guy in a house going crazy movies. The Tenant is obviously a great inspiration for this movie, and Rosemary's Baby, and a lot of Polanski stuff. I like somebody spending a lot of time in their home and then finding their home turning on them, in a way. I like that kind of confinement. I like bad things happening right in your living space. And I also felt like the characters were really vivid. What the hell does that mean? What do you think it means, you ignorant hick? I'm in the middle of a divorce. What you think you're going to get from Stephen King material is not what you actually do. What you get is extremely well-developed characters and really well-thought-out psychology. And all the three main characters were very well-developed and had really clear psychological needs. <laughs> So soon. Well, I play uh, Mort Rainey. I'll see you next time. Mort is a uh, is a writer, novelist, and uh, he's recently gone through a, a very nasty split up with his wife. <laughs> he's having a very hard time with that and sort of yeah, dealing with himself. I think he's the kind of guy who is very uncomfortable around uh, people for the most part. I think he, I think he's it's safe to say he's pretty reclusive and just wants to sort of be left alone. Uh, one day there's a knock on his door. Uh, and this uh, sort of menacing looking guy is there, played by John Turturro, who accuses Mort of um, of plagiarism. You stole my story. Well, I'm sorry. Did I? I don't believe I know you. I play a character called John Shooter, and he's a man from the Deep South who comes up north to accuse Mort Rainey, played by Johnny Depp, of stealing a short story that he's written. Mort, obviously, you know, is insulted and denies it. You're mistaken. I don't read my You read this one already? You stole it. He's a little bit freaked out by the guy, you know, rightly so. And um, basically tells the guy, split, you know, get out of here. This has got to be settled. So far as I'm concerned, it is. And then the guy keeps showing up everywhere. And many interesting and uh, uh, scary things happen because of that. <laughs> Nasty things start to happen. You know, people end up dying. Mort is really, really freaked out and um, brings in a private investigator. Kind of an amazing coincidence, don't you think? The stories being so much alike. Well, obviously the guy copied it from me. Would you like to choose a side before we continue? I'm on your side, but I still need to know the truth. Which kind of situation is this? Uh, Johnny plays a writer and... Um... I'm a friend of his who's an ex-policeman, but now I run my own uh, private investigating firm and security firm. Is he a regular wacko like you've had before, in which case I can help? Or is this something you should be talking to your lawyer about? And Johnny has come to me before with other people, uh, sort of fans, uh, obsessive fans. But he's, he convinces me that this is serious. I got a corporate loyalty thing I got to be back for on Friday, but I can give you a couple of days. So the more I uncover, the, the more interesting it becomes. It's about the struggle between these two guys. And then it's about how the, his asset, his imagination, becomes the thing he needs to use in order to commit murder. But 
we don't know that. The part of him that needs to come out to do that is this dark, awful part, and he imagines it as a wholly separate person because he knows that he himself can't kill, but that part of him can kill. So it's about, um, you know, dual identity. The title, Secret Window, Secret Garden, is the title of the novella, and it's a beautiful title and perfectly apt, and um, would have worked great, but uh, there is a well-known book and film called Secret Garden, so um, we just shortened it to Secret Window, which I think it conveys all that we need to convey as well, a secret window, in this case, into a different part of a, of a guy's brain. So I always thought of Secret Window, Secret Garden as that, you know, the, the window to the self, the real you that's inside. I think it's true that when somebody goes through a trauma or suddenly their life gets turned upside down and they're forced to confront a kind of new beginning and there's a lot of work to do and it's overwhelming, everybody has a window and that window either leads you to a better place or it leads you to a really destructive place and you, you make a choice. There's a great line in a Faulkner book where he says keep passing the open windows because you can make a choice to go through one of them, but you really don't know until you're on the other side where it takes you. So you got to learn a little bit about what it is you need before you choose the window. But most of the time, uh, invariably, people will make a choice for their own secret window. Just bad writing. So you know what to do. Just do it. The writer aspect of it was actually one of the least appealing elements to me because I think that writers are just very boring people, you know. I mean, they're interesting to go out to dinner with and talk to, I think. But what we do is not interesting to look at. You know, it's not like watching a, a basketball player, for God's sake. You know, we sit in a room alone and stare at a screen, sometimes mumbling to ourselves. The only thing that made it work, I thought, was that he can't write. So then he has to do other things. So I wanted to dispense with the obligatory can't write sequence early on. Um, which I did in about 45 seconds just to show it's not going anywhere. In fact, it's going in reverse. You know, he, he, he has one paragraph of mediocre writing which he highlights and deletes. And that's the only writing you see in the movie. I guess I understood that, that feeling of living in your mind um, and letting it, trying to have it be as vivid as possible. And also the feeling when you're alone for a long time, it then becomes hard to relate to people. I'm open to suggestions. I think for a writer, for anyone, you know, who's in the, the creative arts, especially, especially a writer, I mean, a creator, um, your best friend in the world is your imagination and the ability to create. And your worst enemy um, is your imagination. You're plagued by too much thought and too much information, too much stuff going on in your head. Um, but at the same time, that's your bread and butter, isn't it? So, yeah, rough gig. <laughs> it wasn't a particularly difficult adaptation because novellas are more suited to movies than novels are you know, in terms of concept and structure and length, particularly. The, this novella was 135 pages long, I think. And um, there's a containment uh, in terms of character and time and place that, that just works better for movies, you know. I mean, I've had movies where I adapted not one but two books into, into a movie, you know, where you have 600 pages of material you're trying to winnow down. So it wasn't that, it wasn't challenging in that regard. What was challenging is trying to make this ending work because the big idea, I, the ending is different than it was in the novella. It's the most important part of the story, the ending. I think there's an implication that Shooter may have been real. Amy finds his hat in the trash with a note from Shooter. So we wonder if he was a real, if he was a phantom or really existed or what the story was. Stephen King has the best writing deal in the world in that he has all the approvals and all the controls over every step of the production, really, but he doesn't use any of them. Um, he doesn't, he says it's only for nightmare scenarios, only if he sees something horrible going wrong. But he wants you to go make your movie. He, he understands that, you know, they're different media, books and movies, and just as he had to have freedom to write his book, you need to have freedom to make your movie. So he read the script and had some suggestions, and, and that was great, and then he watched an early cut of the movie and had some suggestions, and 
mostly he just wished us well and let us, you know, go do our thing. Casting's exciting but excruciating because so much can go ro so wrong. Uh, those early decisions you make really determine the outcome of your movie to a huge degree. Uh, I think once the script is written and cast, the movie's 70% made. You know, the, the, clearly the direction has a lot to do that can help or hurt at that point, but you really are making extremely large decisions right away, and then throughout the course of making the movie, your decisions get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, until you're just finally saying, eh, try two frames less, try two frames more. Um, but those first decisions about casting your leads are huge, and if you miss by this much, it's like a moonshot, you know, a tiny little miss, uh, misadjustment at the beginning, and you miss the moon by 10,000 miles. Is that you, John Wayne? Johnny was the person I w wanted when I was writing it, and then there was a little bit of steering it through turbulent Hollywood waters to get to the point where we could offer it to Johnny, and uh, thankfully we did. What are you doing here? What I remember most of all was like, you know, reading the screenplay, and you know, getting you know, 10, 15 pages in, and thinking, wow, this is really well written. You know, it's just the dialogue is real and, and it's not forced. No, Mrs. Garvey, what I'm trying to tell you is that someone else wrote this story. Oh, okie dokie then. Somebody does, a character doesn't say something and you can sort of feel that it's, where you can feel that it's gonna feed something out. You know, it's, it, the dialogue is this very train of thought. Here's a useful detail. Thanks for that. Don't ask then, it was working just fine that way. My situation seemed real and ugly and, and uh, yeah. Real. Goodbye, Mart. Goodbye, Amy. And then, you know, reading on a little further, I got to a point where I, I had a total emotional investment in this guy, you know, in, in the character of Mort and his situation. And then, boy, I hit page whatever it was and was completely, I was completely shocked. Did not see it coming, didn't expect a thing. Was, was absolutely shocked. And, uh, I bought it, hook, line, and sinker. You know, I figured if it did that to me as a reader, you know, um, how exciting that could be for audiences, you know, for the viewers. If you talk to that sheriff of yours again, or if you don't show up at 4 o'clock, I will burn your life and every person in it like a cane field in a high wind. I guess this is more like a psychological thriller. Uh, I haven't been in that, you know, many of those kind of films, and it's a different type of tone, so I thought it would be challenging, you know, in a way. Am I supposed to drive down to your house in Riverdale, New York, and ask your wife Amy for it? I read it on your book, Jack. I didn't have him in mind from early on, because I really, I actually try very hard to, to keep actors out of my mind when I'm writing, um, because I think that you're going to be tailoring your stuff to the performer soon enough anyway, might as well let the character just be a character for a while. So Johnny just sort of popped up, but that was abnormal. John, of course, is a great actor, and you know, as soon as his name came up, I was very excited. What's the real reason I come for? Fix the story. Johnny's very uh, easy to work with, very generous, and uh, he has a real sort of ease about his own performance, and he, he, there's a lot of room for you to do your thing, and, and for him to catch it, and, you know, toss it back. And, He's just really easy to work with. I've liked him a lot of things. I want you to fix it. What would you like me to fix? My ending. The one you wrecked. Shooter is the alter ego, the pure artist, the uncompromising artist. Mort is the commercial artist, um, the one who wants, an, wants to please an audience. Shooter could give a shit if he, can, if he pleases an audience or not. He wants to write what is the right story. That's how the story ends, Pilgrim. It's the only ending. You're going to write it for me and get it published. I identify more with Mort, but I aspire more to be Shooter. I'd be more than happy to write your ending, Mr. Shooter. And I think that the idea of your pure writer, you know, eating away at you to, to finish the story right, and if you can't finish it right in print, finish it right in life, 
um, is th that was pretty appealing to me. But what you don't understand is if we do start the fight... Shooter is the danger of the imagination. It's not going to end until one or the other of us is dead. Shooter's kind of the, the protector in a way, you know. He's awful, he's hideous, but he's pure. He's just, he speaks the truth. It's my fault, and I wish I could take it back, but I can't. Well, I guess you shouldn't have fucked him then! Stephen King said, I like your script, man. Every, everybody in it's a rat bastard. <laughs> Thanks. Well, do I have time or what? The idea is that a love triangle is just the best possible thing to hang your movie on. You know, a triangle is the most stable plane in geometry. And it's, it's, it's a perfect basis for a movie. You, you know, you, you deconstruct any of the greatest movies. If it's not a love triangle, it's a triangle of some kind or another. Mm -hmm. Three is a number that really works. And because also because everybody's motivations are so perfectly understandable. Mort's clearly jealousy and rage. Amy's, you know, feelings of uh, abandonment and longing. Ted's uh, feelings of, I guess, lust and then resentment. You know, all of this is, is really so deeply human and so deeply felt that, and, and they're not pretty feelings. You know, they're, they're ugly. Um, and that was kind of what I liked about it. I had one of those feelings I get. I know you think they're stupid and you don't believe them. I am a huge fan of Stephen King and a, a huge fan of thrillers, and I've always wanted to do one. I held off as long as possible, um, but then I couldn't anymore, so here I am. So I read this script and I was so riveted because I had no idea how it was going to turn out in the end. Um, so it really kept me turning the page. Maria Bello is a, is a terrific actress who I've wanted to um, work with for a while. And uh, I, when we first started casting that, I looked at a list and said, mm, oh, Maria Bello, perfect. I met David in New York in February, I think. I took the train up, and it was snowing, and it was a big nightmare. And I walked into his office, and I was like, I love your script. I'd love to do this. <laughs> and, and that was about it. We had just uh, such a terrific meeting, and um, really were on the same page in terms of this character and how she could serve the story. I'm taken by how much she's enjoying the physical part of it because there's a there's a, a part of the movie where it, it becomes really active and a lot of you know stunt work and well violence. And um, Maria hadn't done that in the movie before, and she really loved it. And wanted to do a lot of the stuff herself. <laughs> By the way, I want you to know that none of this was my idea. It was Mr. Rainey all along. You are Mr. Rainey. In a wonderful paranoid thriller sort of way, uh, you really don't know until the end of the movie, in fact, who is real, which characters are real, which characters are imagined, in Mort's head. What is happening to me? Oh, I think you know. I think you have a real good idea. I think people are going to find themselves challenged by who they have sympathy with by the time the movie reaches its conclusion. I think that in general, directing gets harder the more you do it, but working with actors I think gets easier because you calm down a little bit. I think directing gets harder as you, as you do it more because you realize how much more you could do. You know, when you first start out, you think it's easy. You put the camera here, you shoot the thing, and then you realize, well, yes, but if you looked for a better location, if you'd moved the camera, you know, you. You, you realize there's just so much more you can do all the time uh, to help. But with actors, I think that if you become more confident, you calm down with actors and you don't feel threatened by them. And you want their ideas. If they don't work for the movie, you know, you'll talk them out of them or bad ideas will sink under their own weight. I like, yeah, I like to give them as much rope as possible. And if they hang themselves with it, that's okay. We'll figure something else out. Um, so I like to keep it pretty loose and I think I did. Don't go back. Well, the opening, I want it to be very stark and harsh for a number of reasons, because the incident is, is, is so upsetting. And it's, we're really not seeing the incident exactly as it happened. We're seeing it as it felt to Mort. 
So whether it was snowing or not that night, I don't know. But I wanted it to be snowing and windy and cold. I wanted the movie to snap onto the screen. I wanted to cut on, not, not fade up, uh, just a guy's face and have him looking right into the camera and just wonder, oh, who's he? He seems upset. What is he doing? Why is he sitting in that car? Now he's going backwards. Why is he doing that? Where is he going? Now he's stopped again. What's with this guy? You know, I wanted to really draw you in with a lot of questions. That first shot, I wanted to just say, this is our guy. This is who you're going to be following. Uh, pay attention. So it's that close up on him. It's a hood mount on the car. Uh, stays right on his face as he, you know, decides to leave that parking lot and then he stops and decides to go back. Uh, and then I wanted him in the same shot to back away and reveal where he was because we didn't know where he was. So what we did is we had the hood mount on the car so Mort could do, Johnny could do all the crazy kind of driving he wanted to do and be as aggressive as he wanted with the car. And then when he stops, um, we cut and removed the camera from the car, you know, took, took the hood mount off and put it on an arm over the hood of the car and lined the shot up as exactly as we could with the previous shot. And then in one of the wiper passes, we did a little digital trick, and it's the new shot. And so you see him back away in what appears to be the same shot. And you see Motel in the background, and you think to yourself, oh, oh, I think I have a feeling what's going on here, and I think I don't like it. Making the snow, uh, and making the night, and making the red Motel letters, and everything in that scene is either black, white, or red. At least that was our intention. If you go into the Motel room, you see the production design in it. It, everything in it is black, white, or gray. Uh, later, at the same motel, when you see Ken Kelsch there, you realize, oh, in fact, it's that kind of disgusting motel room orange. You know, the colors are very rich, but that's not the way Mort remembers it. He remembers black, white, and then and the red of passion and anger and murderous rage. David really showed his self to us on the first night, showed what kind of a director he was. We were in the motel room, Tim and I in bed, and Johnny storms through this motel room, and it's snowing outside and this whole thing. I didn't want to hear anything anybody said, because I feel like it's all stuff we've heard a million times, and it's also seemed suddenly way too personal, and I wanted to get out of that room, you know, instead of hearing everybody scream their recriminations at each other. So, um, and I also wanted the actors in the room to be, to seem, you know, shocked and as if they'd been awakened rudely by a madman. And how David set it up was, the room was completely dark. There was no people in there, no cameras. This never happens on a set, by the way. Tim and I laid in bed for, it must have been 15 or 20 minutes. So I didn't tell him, but I put a bunch of um, great big stereo speakers in the room and uh, rigged the lights in the room to go on when the door opened. You know, we had, uh, we had an electrical board with a you know, huge switch we were gonna throw, so. And then I let him sit for a while and didn't really tell him when we were rolling, so. We didn't hear him call action. We didn't know when he was coming in the door. We didn't know anything. And so the next thing you knew, the door burst open. And these loud speakers came on with this crazy sound. And it was so real and we got so freaked out, you know, you couldn't help to react to that. I think they were quite startled. Uh, we, we do put a little bit extra with his scream to, to because th that was Johnny's idea. He wanted to, he understood I didn't want to hear any dialogue and he said, I feel like I want to just go up to the bed and scream at them, sort of like using voice as weapon. And it seemed like a great idea, so he did it. And then we just kind of helped it out a little bit in uh, post to, to, to give it a slightly surreal upsetting quality. Well, first of all, you want, to, you want to establish setting. And since Mort doesn't get out of the house that much, we have to get out of the house. And the time to do it seemed like main titles. So I want to say, look, here's where we are. See how isolated it is. That's why we start out so wide. Nobody around except this tiny little house here. Then we move closer to the house here, and we keep lining the house up in the dissolves, you know, to get closer and closer. Um, and then we have the shot that wraps all the way around the house and comes in what we learn later is the secret window. Uh, and across the desk to see what he's been working on. It's clearly, it's a story about what happened six months ago and he hasn't made much progress and what he has isn't very good either. And then out over the railing, and then we see a mirror. My idea was that we pass actually through the mirror. We go, we go into the mirror and find the guy on the couch, which will seem a little odd 
to the viewer, but you'll forget about it. You'll think, well, is that a window or a mirror? Whatever, there's a knock at the door. I, I guess I better pay attention. Um, and my idea is this is a visual clue. We are entering his consciousness. The rest of this movie now is going to be subjective. It's going to be from his point of view. We are going literally through the looking glass into the crazy guy's head. Uh, then, if you're watching later at the end, of, toward the end of the movie, when Mort has gone full-blown crazy, and uh, Shooter gives him the hat and says, "Now you better end your story." Mort hears Amy's car. He turns around and sees the car, uh, and then we cut back to him, and when we can see the driveway in the mirror behind him, we move past him and into the mirror again, and find ourselves out at the car with Amy. Mort. Well, in fact, what we've done is come out of the mirror, and I'm telling the audience, you're no longer now in his point of view. Now you're back in an objective reality. So everything between the mirror shots is either occurred wholly in his head or was tainted by his, by his craziness. Everything on the outside of him is the way it happened. I figured, where do you go after, after something like that happens in your life? And you'd go to the most peaceful place you could possibly imagine. So we found this gorgeous lake, uh, Sakakomi, in Montreal, or outside Montreal, which uh, is just like upstate New York, where it's supposed to be, same mountain range. Uh, we found, basically we found a spot that we loved, that worked, that had lots of, that had water surrounding it on two sides instead of just one, and built a cabin there. And then we built the same, in the interior of the cabin on a stage. We, we did shoot some interiors on the cabin at the lake because it's dressed out, but it's smaller. We cheated by about five feet in depth and five feet in width um, because the piece of land there was small and you know, we had to fit the cabin in. So anything you see looking out of the cabin with maybe a wall in it is usually on the location. Anything looking in is usually the set. Now, where was I? The idea is that the cabin's womb-like. That's where that's you know it's supposed to feel comforting and warm. And Fred Murphy, the cinematographer, shot it very richly. And, and Howard Cummings, the production designer, used a lot of very rich colors and made it look like a place. I, you know, I, I would always go into that cabin on, and say, I, I really need one of these. I really need. Everybody on the crew was saying, I need a cabin just like this on a lake like this, um, because the idea is you retreat somewhere safe. And then if that somewhere safe turns on you, then you're really in trouble. If you go into a great big creepy house, of course bad things are going to happen to you. If you go into a comforting, soothing, restful place and bad things happen to you, well then you really got a problem. Well, Johnny's look mostly came from Johnny. You know, we uh, uh, certainly our costume designer, uh, Odette uh, Gadori, had a lot of ideas and brought a lot of stuff. Um, and he sort of picked what he felt most comfortable with. The bathrobe he immediately sparked to and wanted to wear for the whole movie. Um, I got it down to not quite the whole movie. Um, but uh, I think it's a great thing because to him, it's a, you know, it was a security blanket is the, is the idea. I work with the director, but a lot with him, with Johnny. He had some ideas that we chat together and we tried a lot, a lot of things. And finally, we took the direction of working with the color, the mid-tone color, kind of color that they were very strong, but they fade down like under the sun. It's a kind of twilight zone. Everything is loose, everything is fade, and the texture are hemp and cotton. So I work with a technician to age and dye to have the right tone. Compared to the flashback and compared to the other character where the color is more bright, more colorful, more happy, he's, he is lost, so it makes him more vulnerable. He came in with uh, you know, the glasses and hair and you know, his general look he came in with. I think uh, most good actors have pretty strong ideas about how they think they should look for uh, a part, and he certainly does. You stole my story. It seems like he stepped out of out of the depression. You know, he seems like <laughs> he's John Turturro's character is a very um, tough thing to do because he is a, a, a phantom. He's a figment of imagination, and therefore has to seem somewhat imagined. But you can't give away the fact that he's made up. 
that he doesn't really exist. So his look was going to be extreme, and his look was going to be different. And it, it was pretty much just verbatim. I just took uh, King's description of him in the book, in the novella, and put it in the script, and we came up with that. I mean, the big struggle was the hat. How big is too big? How big is, you know, how big is too small? How do we keep it on his head? How do we keep it stiff so it doesn't, because when it became floppy, he suddenly looked like uh, the scarecrow. Um, so we, uh, so we spent a lot of time on that, but it was really just as described in the novella. And, uh, and, and then, of course, in retrospect, when you, when you think about the movie, you think, oh, well, no wonder he seemed a little over the top. He, he, was, he was made up. The shooter, uh, John Turturro, is wearing, it's not a black, but I want a strong silhouette compared to Mort. So I use color as a base, like beige, brown, and gray, and we put it in the dirty water just to make him look like black or dark color, but it's an almost black, it's smoky. And for me, it was a kind of shadow. I don't think you really owe that well. Stealing from another man, that don't seem to have ever bothered you none. John worked on the accent with uh, through tapes and interviews with uh, with a uh, dialect coach and uh, came in with it. And uh, the, the problem with the southern accent is it does tend to slow you down because the you know the vowels are stretched. Didn't have the stomach to do it yourself, but you knew I did. So it's tricky to do a southern accent and yet keep keep up the pace of of what you're doing. But I thought he did a great job with it. I did not steal your story. Oh, I expect you'll let yourself go to Greenhaven for murder before you'll admit it. I have the magazine, you lunatic. I have the magazine! Finding what is any particular person's greatest fear is, I think, King's gift. And one of the reasons a, a, a horror movie will work or not work. Um, I think for a writer to be accused of plagiarism is, is to be accused of being nothing. All you have is your story, and if it's not your story, then you don't exist, which is why I think I like uh, Shooter's panic on the road when uh, when Johnny says he's going to get the magazine at three o'clock, and Shooter seems for the first time truly scared. There can't be any magazine, not with that story in it. That story is mine. His panic is because if there is a magazine with that story in Mort's name, he doesn't exist, and I think that's a that's a frightening thought. You bring me that story if it exists. Johnny and John are both so experienced, they must have 100 movies between them, you know, they, that uh, we didn't require a lot of rehearsal, nor would it have been very advantageous, because they're not supposed to have a great familiarity with one another. So we mostly read the material to see where does it work, where, does it, where doesn't it, what can, how can we, you know, finish the writing, and then uh, just threw them at each other, and they're both very responsive to what the other one's doing, and they, had, they looked like they were having a lot of fun. I don't shoot a lot of takes because I think they're both so good you tend to get what you need pretty quickly, you know. What's fun is, uh, is you can throw stuff at them just to see what they'll do, just for fun, because they're gifted actors. Books tend to be about what people think and feel, and movies are about what people say and do. So this one was a particular challenge in that. There's a lot of Mort's thoughts. It's all Mort's thoughts. He's in a cabin alone. There's nobody to talk to. That's why I had him talk to his dog so much uh, in the beginning, because it's a chance to get to hear what's on his mind. I didn't steal it. And we do hear his thoughts a bit as the movie goes on. This is not my beautiful house. This is not my beautiful wife. But it's very tricky, because you got to hear his thoughts, and you got to hear him talking to himself without you know, tipping the hand that he's a lunatic, and we tend to think of talking to yourself a lot as crazy behavior, even though we all do it. So when we hear Mort's thoughts in the movie, whenever we hear them, he's always addressing himself as you. He doesn't say I, or, you know, he says... So you know what to do. Just do it. You need to do this, or, or don't do it. He's instructing himself, so that his inner voice I wanted to present as a separate character. No bad writing. And then later in the movie, he literally becomes a separate character who exists flesh and blood, and we realize, oh, he's not just hearing his own voice in his head, he's seeing himself. <laughs> There's really something wrong with this guy. If you don't go ahead and bite her, I'll kill her. Well, it used to be a cat. In, this, in the novella, it was a cat. And uh, I think Stephen King and my girlfriend both suggested, why don't you make it a dog? I mean, you know, what kind of man gives his love to a cat? Come on. 
it's a dog, you know, then we'll really hate this guy. So I made a dog, and then because I couldn't leave well enough alone, I made it a blind dog. If you, <laughs> as I cast this 10-year-old dog with cataracts that kept bumping into things. And in fact, on one shot, if you, if you look at the shot where the dog walks out the doggy door, he's sort of staggering off to the right and then redirects himself toward the thing because that's because his trainer was, was whistling outside. All right, go ahead and be discouraged, you blind bastard. See if I care. Anyway, that's Chico. The decision to kill the dog was not, I, I got a, I'm a dog killer from way back. I killed a dog in Lost World. Uh, got plenty of mail about that. Nobody cares about, you know, I mean, he also kills four people in the movie. You know, I, I don't know. That seems mildly objectionable to me. But um, it's, it's a way of sending a message, surely, to a character that you're serious. And it's a relatively easy way to uh, get the audience to hate your bad guy. After the dog is killed, uh, he has to take steps. You can't, you can't just go back in your cabin and go to bed. You have to do something. So he does what, what anyone would do, he goes to the police. However, in this case, it's a sheriff who doesn't seem too concerned about what's happened and who happens to be arthritic. It's a small town, not a lot goes on there. Needlepoint, can you believe it? Doc says it's good for the arthritis. And Johnny's character is just not really comforted by that. So he moves on, and he and he looks for uh, he he looks for somebody who can protect him. He thinks, and he goes to town and meets the Charles Dutton character, who's a private investigator. Which kind of situation is this? Is he a regular wacko like you've had before? In which case, I can help. A much more reassuring and authoritative figure than than the local sheriff was. Um, however, he's also uh, expensive. You remember my rate? Yeah, an obscene fortune, right? In, in, a lot, these are now expositional scenes, and. Um, you need something more, to, there's a lot of information you have to hear, but you need to be entertained while you're hearing it, and those, those are usually great opportunities for some humor if you can find it. So in the private investigator scene, what I wanted was to have a, uh, a timer, uh, like a lawyer might have on their desk, and that when Dutton agrees to take the case, he clicks the thing and it starts ticking. My story came out a couple years. Meaning the money clock is running, and then when Johnny gets offended by something he said, he turns it off, and it becomes a bit of a chess match back and forth, which is, which is just a nice, subtle thing, but I think helps you through the scene. The scene where he hears a sound upstairs, right after Kelch has left, figures, you know, right after your protection leaves, and that's when you hear the scary sound. It was a very difficult scene to do because, again, there's nothing there except his fear and the fact that he's hearing things. And the, the smashing of the mirror is another big clue, which I'm sure some people will pick up, that there is nobody except him. And he's seeing his own reflection, and for a good reason. So it was, it was tricky to pull off, because there's really nothing there, and there's nothing for him to be scared of. Um, and therefore, nothing for us to be scared of. And there's nothing to cut to. It's not, you can't shoot it like the standard suspense, where you cut to the guy hiding, you cut to him, they don't see each other, back to him, back to the guy hiding, they shift positions. There's a sequence I understand. I know how to shoot that. Since I can only be in his point of view, it's very difficult to make suspense. Um, to the extent that we did it, I think it, it, it worked. But it was hard. It was deceptively hard, because it seemed like it ought to be easy. I killed a mirror. There's also a thing I did in uh, Johnny's character Mort is continually flustered by young women whenever he sees them in the movie. So you see in the sheriff's office, the sheriff's niece is there and she laughs at something and he finds her just flustering. And then in, in Dutton's office, uh, a young assistant comes in carrying a tray of something or other and it really throws him off his game. And, uh, later in the movie at the post office, the post office girl seems to throw him in. The idea is, of course, that you know, he's had this bad experience and he's having these homicidal feelings toward women and so uh, young women make him very, very nervous. But then at the end of the movie when he asks the young girl out on a date, I thought it was a nice perverse twist that now that he's killed four people, he's really, he's, he's tan, dressed and ready and wants to date. <laughs> I just thought that was kind of funny. Hi. The house that we found, the house, the white, happy house that you see, is in a suburb of Montreal, uh, which we thought looked a bit like uh, Riverdale. 
what our job then was to find a lot that basically matched it and build a burned down version of that house. Strangely, the owners would not let us burn down their house. And, you know, we wanted to set a whole scene there, so to do it with any kind of special effects didn't make a lot of sense. So we found a lot that looked like it and then sculpted a, tr a burned down tree that would match perfectly. And then we lined up those dissolves so that they would match perfectly in the driveway. And, the th you know, it, 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 we did, I think we did a very nice job of really making everything match so it looks like the same spot. Thank you, Ted. Ted is an interesting character in that he is, by the way he's presented from scene one, he's inherently unlikable. He's, he's an interloper. He's, a, he's an adulterer. He's cuckolding the movie star. You know, we can't, we can't have this kind of behavior. This is terrible. So we're sort of predestined not to like him, which is why I cast Tim Hutton, who is pretty much the soul of empathy. So. I like that our feelings are very ambiguous. You know, Hutton, we, we're used to having sort of warm feelings toward, and he certainly conveys, I think, a lot of warmth and, uh, and regular guyness and a sense of sort of suburban safety. But he's not a nice guy. He stole a wife. He's a wife stealer, for God's sake. Bother you if I answer one or two of these, Ted? And so when I was talking to Tim about the possibility of him doing the, the part, um, I think he said something about, there was a scene that used to take place in the hallway outside the insurance company where they have a little bit of an argument. I'm real sorry you had to miss that. I know how much you like my things. Johnny's character says something to me that pisses me off, so I say, all right, you and me are going to have a little talk. I'm in trouble. So when David and I, David Kep and I met for the first time, uh, we talked about it happening on the sidewalk. Which, which then happened and allowed us to actually film in New York, which is great. Yeah, look, uh, marriage is in. I'm sorry, but uh, I didn't end yours. And then I started thinking about this idea of the bus, which, uh, you know, Hutton's so wrapped up in, in talking to him and, and telling him to back off and stop bothering them that he's backing him up toward the end of the street, and then a, a, a bus comes by. We're left to wonder for a moment. Was he, tr was he thinking about pushing him in front of the bus? Was that a coincidence? What exactly happened there? Are we uh, getting the message I'm sending? And I think there's a lot of ambiguity around Tim's part, which is good. You know, in a, it's a wonderful thing in a movie to wonder what's going on um, until it's a terrible thing. Then it's a fine line. Same thing applies later, actually, when they're at the gas station. I think you know what I'm talking about. Well, Teddy, I think I do, but here's the problem. I don't respond well to intimidation. It makes me feel icky. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Again, it's, it's ambiguous. We're, we're not quite sure. We know Mort is talking about Shooter very clearly if you watch the movie a second time. Ted is talking about Amy. So when Mort says something like, Where's your buddy? Ted's natural thought is, well, he means Amy. And he says, Came alone. And when Mort says, Go back and tell that to your filthy little friend. He's referring to Shooter. Ted takes a swing at him because he thinks he just called Amy filthy. Ah! God! That scene was essential to the red herring of thinking Ted might be behind it all, but not cheating. There's no cheating in that scene. Nobody ever says something just because the movie needs them to say it. They say it because that's what they really mean. Now, the, the, the trickiest moment in the scene is when Mort says, I buried my dog, mister. To which Ted looks away in a manner that could be interpreted as guilt and remorse, or it could be interpreted as, Jesus, this guy's a lunatic. I see what Amy's been talking about, <laughs> you know, and I think the look plays both ways. Well, the idea is all build up and then very quick payoff. I, I think that that's, that's the stuff that I just I find most effective. I think his walk to the car is the heart of the scene. And then the discovery of the bodies is incidental. That's conveying information we need to know. It's almost expositional. And the shorter it is, the more effective it is. I also use his head a lot in all the scenes at the Path by the Lake. There's always a take where the camera is behind Mort's head following him. And in this case, I was using his head to block the information and make the scene more interesting, to make us try to want to lean around his head to see what's in the car, and that draws us further into the scene. And in the first scene at the, at the lake, when Mort meets Shooter for the second time, we're following Mort's head, and he stops, and then the camera drifts to the left, 
revealing Shooter leaning against his car, and they start their dialogue. And again, it's another visual hint that this character grew out of his head, literally, and uh, doesn't really exist. But in the scene where he discovers the dead bodies, the idea is to approach the car as slowly as possible, withhold the information as long as possible, and then get it out very, very quickly. <laughs> And then my favorite part of the scene is Mort staggering back and turning around and looking at the squirrel, uh, which, and I'm not really sure what that means. <laughs> I just thought the idea that the squirrel knows is somehow uh, upsetting in some way or another, and, and just an odd detail. It's that kind of thing when you're having a slightly out of body experience like discovering dead bodies must be, I'm sure it's the strange detail that you remember like there was a squirrel there, and I thought that gave it some character. I think it's just more effective when you imply rather than show. You know, it's an old movie lesson that people keep learning over and over again, or someone rediscovers and, and everyone says, oh, what a genius, he, he didn't show us the, the the fish or the ghost or the alien. Um, I think that what's not seen is always much more upsetting than what is seen. And I thought that I liked the idea of covering the guy's eyes in a uh, you know POV dead guy shot where the paper comes over his face and then we hear <coughs> We can imagine what a screwdriver being pulled out of a, a head looks like. But if we really shot it, and we did shoot it, you know, it looks like a screwdriver being pulled out of a plastic head, which is not so terribly impressive. But in the darkness, sitting there alone in the dark theater, hearing the sound of, a, of what we imagine is a screwdriver coming out of a skull, um, it's really squirm-inducing, I think. some suspense <laughs> and um, I felt like that was a great opportunity to to have a you know what looked like a simple endeavor push this car over the cliff turn into a potentially life-threatening thing uh, and that is watch gets caught I like just made it kind of fun and exciting I was trying early in the movie to suggest he has a vivid dream life. So there are a couple dreams in the movie, very brief. I just wanted dream images, really, more than full-fledged dreams. For example, early on, he sees his door uh, banging off the hinges, uh, and then he sees a shadowy shooter figure moving through it. And they're just images, because he's had this upsetting encounter, and somebody's banging, trying to get into his house, or banging, trying to get into his subconscious, or out of his subconscious. And then later, the scene where he wakes up on the couch, rolls over and sees a deadly ocean rock, sees at the top of a cliff and there are rocks below with ocean surf crashing on them, and falls off the couch and thinks he's falling off a cliff and then lands on his floor. I think I was trying to do two things. I was trying to suggest that he has a vivid dream life, vivid inner life, and another hint that he might be imagining other things. Also, I, I just like the idea, we've all had that thing where when you're falling asleep or waking up, you think you're falling. Um, and, and you catch yourself and realize you're not, and I, I wanted to put that on film. We actually got that, that cliff footage from uh, Lost World. I didn't want to have to go shoot, and I didn't have time or money to go shoot such beautiful footage, so I uh, uh, asked Spielberg if I could have some of the B-roll from uh, when the trailer's hanging over the cliff in the Lost World, because I remember they had great stuff. So uh, he gave us that, so thank you, Steven. Very quiet, here we go, and roll it. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs>
to reveal that uh, Mort is in fact crazy and there is no shooter uh, is something I wanted to do gradually. Traditionally, you would have a great big moment of reveal and the audience would gasp and your rating scores would go up and people would like that. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. But since I felt like that's something we've seen a lot, I didn't want to do it at the very end of the movie. I wanted to do it a good 15 minutes before the end of the movie. And I wanted us to say, oh, Lord, as opposed to shrieking. The whole idea was you invest in this character, you know, and present him in the most sympathetic way possible. I mean, he's, you know, poor guy. He's been cheated on. He's Now he's got some crazy stalker. You know, he's got an old blind dog that he loves that somebody kills. I mean, I couldn't have made him more sympathetic if I'd tried. Uh, so the, the, the idea is to get the audience to put all their emotional eggs in this one basket and then realize 90 minutes into the movie, oh shit, I've made a horrible mistake. I'm rooting for a madman. But by then it's too late and you have no choice. You must go through it, the rest of it with him because who else's side are you going to be on? So we've heard him talking to himself. We've heard him, his own voice in his head. But the scene in the car where he finds the magazine uh, with the story cut out is the first time his voice has turned on him and started asking him questions. Wait a minute. How would he do that? Which he then answers. I don't know. Which is a hint that something's not quite right here. But he did it. Then he goes in the house and puts the hat on and is further questioned by his, his inner voice. What are you doing? Why are you putting your hat on? Why'd you put it on? I don't know. And then his inner voice actually shows up. Wait a minute now, back up just a sec. And starts telling him, look, seriously, things are spinning out of control here. Um, those shots I wanted, I wanted to be able to have him move and walk around the room. It's not a great trick to have an actor be in the same frame as himself. I've been doing that for years. Um, it is difficult to move the camera and do that. It involves motion control shots where a great big huge noisy camera is programmed to make the same move over and over and over again. Um, and it's just a little more complicated. Again, it's not groundbreaking, but it's visually interesting, I thought, to run into himself many times. And I, what I hadn't seen is a character trying to escape himself, which is literally what he's trying to do, but keep being cut off by himself, which was why we wanted those shots like that. You know, there's a funny one where he's, uh, yeah, we did a version when he's moving around the room where the inner voice talks like Marlon Brando by the door. Wait a minute now, back up just a sec. What about that? and Christopher walking on the sofa. And well, Pilgrim, Shooter's Bay, and a half a dozen other things you've chosen to ignore. Roman Polanski by the kitchen. Are these merely coincidences? I'm wearing his bruises, aren't I? Aren't I? Are you? It's funny, I think. It's funny, I think it's funny. Much better, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> really? No, you almost killed him. You wanted to. The gun was not loaded. When the inner voice says, look, there is no John Shooter. There never has been. You invented him. Um, then I wanted the shot to circle him, and it starts out wide, and as it circles, becomes more and more and more of a close-up. Um, and I wanted some interaction between them, which then, of course, makes things diff more, even more difficult. Uh, he grabs his arms and pulls them down away from his face. This is how it happens Shut to up! people. When he was really losing it, and his psyche just collapses, uh, Johnny wanted to just make sounds again, so he came up with... Uh, I, I guess his son had been, uh, it was pre-verbal at the time we shot the movie, but, but was, but was expressing himself by saying, rah, uh, which was a way of just announcing to the world that he was confused. So he would say, rah, rah, and, uh, that somehow found its way into his performance. Rah! I never has rah! been. You invented him. Rah, rah! He felt like it, Mort's gone all the way back to before he had words to describe things, and now he's just making sounds, which I thought was great. Johnny's just one of our most gifted actors, period. Uh, he, he's a, a font of ideas. I mean, he's just a, a great actor. He, what I like about his ideas is you're not sure if he's kidding or not at first, because they're, they're, they're off the wall, but then they make perfect sense and you wouldn't have it any other way. He's not an actor who does what he's told. He's an actor who takes what he's been asked to do and runs it through his brain and then does it. And that's, you know, that's, that's a wonderful gift because he's got a marvelous twisted brain. Leave me alone! You are alone. When he throws the ashtray, it hits the wall, uh, and then a crack grows. And continues to grow and grows all the way over top of the roof and down the other wall. And, uh, and the idea of the, uh, the crack shot was a pretty literal visual metaphor. He's cracked 
<laughs> and uh, I just like the idea that uh, this is it. This is a. This is this is it. You're nuts. He's a split personality. There's two of him. It's everything is very literal about the crack. And I debated cutting it. And maybe I should have. But I think it's interesting to look at. And I like the idea of watching our poor character just hallucinating wildly. You're not handling this. Well, the idea is whenever you have a difficult or complex visual sequence, uh, the more information you have ahead of time, the better it's gonna go. So rather than just conventional storyboards, which are helpful for a certain kind of shooting, um, we did animatics, which are moving 3D animations of what the scene is gonna look like. There's a terrific company in Canada called uh, Keyframe that, that does these. And you know, I would describe the sequence to them, do little sketches, they would come back with, with a little animation, then we'd get the set design in and give them that, and they would change their animation to match the set design. And what it does is it allows everybody to know exactly what's expected and where they need to devote their efforts. The more detail you have before you shoot, the better the shooting goes. And the idea also then is to make it easier on the actor. If you've got your shit together before, then you can be calm and allow the actor to act. Because the problem with effect shots is the acting is often stilted because they're acting to nothing. It's impossible, you know. And poor Johnny, I mean, that was a very difficult day because he's shifting his eye line from an orange thing with a smiley face on it to another orange thing with a smiley face on it to a guy with a stick to, you know, at a certain point in the middle of one of his more impassioned uh, uh, bits of dialogue in the movie, we had a guy pop up into frame and pull his arms down and then duck down again. And that just, you know, the first couple takes, we just all laughed because it's just absurd. <laughs> we pass through the mirror or come out of the mirror because we di didn't know it but we were in the mirror the whole movie so far uh, now we come out of the mirror and we're in an objective reality and we see things the way Amy sees them and Amy is sane so she's seeing what it really is and the cabin is a mess um, the cabin has been a mess we just didn't know it because we were seeing it from Johnny's point of view uh, and he's a lunatic it's sort of traditional uh, you know uh, attractive woman in a scary house sequence, but with the strange uh, twist that we're not quite sure what we want to happen to her. We think we want her to get away, but then again, there's that uh, cute Johnny Depp, and, but we certainly don't want him to kill her, but uh, so it's a, I think it's an, uh, an odd sequence, I hope, in a good way. Since the beginning of the movies, and now we realize he had a gun in the hotel at the beginning of the movie, and he had gone there to shoot her. And so I think the process of carving the word shooter all over the walls, which shooter, which was drawn from Ted's hometown, which he must have heard at some point before, Cougar's Bay, he stumbled upon the fact that shoot her is an extension of that. And I think it's a chilling moment. <laughs> Sort of reminiscent of Red Rum being murder in The Shining, of course. Where, where'd you get that old thing, the attic? It's mine. Wasn't ever anybody else's. You know, when a script uh, begins in one way and you think, okay, this is what this script is, and it can be, you know, incredibly written and rich characters and all that, but then when it takes an unexpected turn, and when you've read a lot of scripts and it surprises the hell out of you, you know, it's, it's really something. Everything that you're doing is wrong. The ending was what it was all about for me. The, the, the idea was, I think an audience responds when an ending seems appropriate and when it's satisfying, not because it's happy, but because it's the logical conclusion of events. I think what audiences don't like is when things sort of peter out. And so I thought, if we're going to do this, let's do it all the way. I'm about done fussing with you. Uh, we get to the violence, and again, I, yeah, I like to show a lot of implied violence, but not a lot of actual violence, just because I don't think there's that much artistry in it. Um, it, with the exception of the shovel hit, which I thought was a lot of fun. <laughs> he comes racing in like a cavalry. Uh, a cavalry we would 
kind of rather not see succeed, although we can't admit that because we don't want anybody to kill him. You can't be rooting for somebody to kill people who are basically innocent. So I was very anxious about how that would play. But the one audience we showed the movie to, when Ted gets hit in the face with the shovel, they all clapped. And I thought, well, this is an odd turn of events. And I'm not sure how I feel about it. I think I like it because it's perverse, but that's how it played anyway. Hi. And then the very end of the movie, Johnny wanted to have a completely different look, which I thought was a great idea. And so the idea is that now that he has exorcised these demons and he's uh, gone out and done a bunch of killing, which is terrible and he's completely insane and should be punished for the rest of his life, don't get me wrong, but he's worked it out of his system so he's feeling a little bit better. So uh, the idea is now he's concentrating on himself and he's cleaned himself up. He's got a haircut. He's, uh, he's gotten some braces, because I think you see he's grinding his teeth throughout the movie, you know, he, he does that jaw thing all the time. So he's got the braces to fix that. If you look carefully, he's got some, uh, a weightlifting bench and an exercise bike in his living room. And just the idea that Mort has cleaned his plate and he's ready to date seems very funny to me. Hi. And then when the sheriff shows up, uh, and he's boiling all the corn and eating it. it the, the idea is that when he looks most put together on the outside is when the psychosis is raging at its worst on the inside. And then, originally, when, when we drift out the window, I had shot it all the way down into the ground so that we, we built this bows relief of underground material and roots, and we followed the roots all the way down to the dead bodies. Uh, and we actually see, you know, these rotting dead bodies on the ground. But I cut it because I, I felt it was, while graphic and, and pleasing in one way, it, it, it was kind of inelegant, and the rest of the movie hadn't been like that. Um, the rest of the movie had been implied, and that seemed a little Tales from the Crypt at the end of a movie that, that was different from that. So we drift down to the corn and go into black and think the movie's over and then come back for the close-up of the biting the corn. I just like movies that end on sharp punctuation rather than a slow iris out, so we tried to end it sharply. Hey, can we bring the camera back in? That's cool. Okay. It's not necessarily hard to make a movie as a director if you have some experience. What's hard is to make a movie that you really care about and that you really want to make and slide it through the system and feel like, oh my god, I can't believe they're letting me make this. And that's the way I felt on this one and I, I hope I always get to feel that way. The only thing that matters is the ending.